I'm tapping this out on my phone, so pardon any formatting issues. Last night, my wife of seven years decided to relax. After dinner, she headed to the den to catch her shows while I toggled between the Spurs game, football, and soccer, and tackled a few planned tasks. Suddenly, she brought out the wine and polished off two bottles. Around midnight, I checked on her and found her fast asleep on the couch. As I went to lift her up, her eye watch buzzed with a message that flashed on the screen, I can't do that. My man would hit the roof. Intrigued, I clicked on it. It turned out to be a chat between my wife and a friend. He's not exactly a close buddy, but we've played soccer together for years, shared drinks, and known each other since our teenage years. Back then, we used to joke that he was the code holder during fights, the guy who stayed out of the fray and watched the jackets. So, as I said, I pushed on the conversation while this thing was still attached to her wrist and scrolled up to the top. As far as I could tell, it's him that contacts her first, unless she's deleted something. There was lots of flirting and wink-winking going on but nothing that you could outright say was cheating. Then I got to last night, and when she's drunk, she starts openly begging him for sex. I couldn't believe my eyes. I'm paraphrasing here because I can't remember the exact words, but she was saying things like how much she had always wanted him, how no one would ever find out if he did want to do something, and the last one that killed me, that she was great at keeping secrets. I tried to scroll on her watch but couldn't find any other messages, and I don't know her phone passcode. I put her in bed and just sat in the kitchen in shock until I fell asleep, then got up for work at about 5.30. When I went to get in my work van, I just slumped down on the wheel and realized I couldn't face it. So I went back in the house, grabbed a half-drunk bottle of vodka, filled it to the top with coke, and went on a walk down the railway line. We live beside a long stretch of woodlands and a disused railway line that goes for miles. I've walked about half the length of it. I'm sitting under a railway bridge like a freaking troll right now, just stewing over the whole thing. You probably think there's a fire going from a mile away due to the steam coming out of my ears. So, what do I do? I don't want to speak to her, I can't even bear to look at her after reading that. It was like a dagger through my heart. I just feel like every morsel of love I had for her has evaporated into thin air after reading her begging like that, damn nasty. I honestly want to ghost her, man. If I could, I would never speak to her again. The I'm great at keeping secrets was the thing that got me, though. Like, who even are you? It reeks, but it's a case of how far down the rabbit hole do I want to go. I don't care, if I'm being honest. I'm just done. I've never felt so betrayed and disgusted in all my life. The thing is, I've invested so much in her, not just as a partner but as a person. I loved her so much and thought her personality, and by extension my personality, reflected that of good people. To realize she's a backstabbing snake makes me feel like a snake. I feel like a worse person than I was yesterday. The only way I can describe it is if someone you looked up to, took advice and life lessons from, suddenly turned out to be a pedophile or a rapist or just a downright creep. Your entire perception of yourself and who you are would be shattered because you've taken on board what they've said and invested time into a creep. God, I'm rambling nonsense. I apologize. Unluckily, our house is owned by my parents who moved to a retirement village six years ago. We moved in, and the house will be bequeathed to me when they pass away. Hopefully, I won't own it for a long time. They couldn't be bothered with the upkeep and all the problems, wanting to see out their final days in peace. So, when we do divorce, my soon-to-be ex won't be getting her hands on it. So, what do I do then? I'm honestly thinking of just not saying a word and throwing her right out. Also, while walking here, it crossed my mind to get my mate, who's a locksmith, to quietly change the locks today. I could feed her any old garbage about something being broken from the door, she won't care what's going on anyway as long as I'm around. 
Then, after he's done, lock the front door and tell her to come and look at something out the back. When she comes out, I could run back in and lock the door behind me. That sounds childish, doesn't it? Seriously though, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm staring at a bottle right now, and my life feels like it has been ripped apart at the seams. As for that prick, my so-called friend, there's no doubt he was up to something here. There's also no doubt I wouldn't have caught wind of this at all, so I'll be seeing him very soon. Never mind holding jackets, he'll be holding his face. Wednesday, October 28th. Thank you to everyone who reached out to me after my first post. It was appreciated. Yesterday, after I had written the post and was in a complete mess, two dog walkers came over to check on me as I was concerning them. I told them everything, and they listened. The first thing one of them said to me was, Son, the worst thing you can do right now is drink, it'll cause carnage. I have to thank her for that because I was on the highway to hell at that point. I threw the vodka away, got in touch with a friend, and he said I could come to his for a while to calm down. He was at work but told me where the spare key was. We live in a small town of around 15,000 people, and he wasn't too far away. So once I got there, I sat on his couch, just trying to calm down. Throughout the morning, I was getting multiple texts and phone calls from my wife asking where I was and what the hell was up, as my work van was still sitting in the driveway and I was nowhere to be seen. I texted her back, telling her that there was a problem with the engine, so I got a lift into work, which she seemed to buy. She just texted back saying, Oh. When my friend got back from work at about 5 o'clock, I told him everything that had happened and asked his opinion. I also told him not to tell anyone about the jacket holder, as that might get back to my wife, which I didn't want at this point. I would deal with him later. By that, I mean I'll expose what a little rat he is. Knocking him out doesn't help me at all as of now. As an aside, to the people saying he had done nothing wrong, he messaged my wife first. He was being extremely flirty. Why the hell would he even bother corresponding with my wife? He only knows her briefly from afar. Look, I've got no problem with two adults conversing with each other, but they hardly knew each other, and it was flirty from the start, as far as I could tell. I think they've seen each other while out and about, and it's gotten flirty then. So my friend convinced me to try and keep a low profile and see what I could dig up, but at the same time speak to a lawyer and get the ball rolling in terms of finding out my options, which I have done today. He took me home about 6 o'clock, and I was honestly dead on my feet by that point. I think the adrenaline pumping the entire day, then suddenly stopping, knocks it right out of you. So I was extremely tired when I got home. The second. I walked through the door and knew something was up. My wife was on me right away, asking me all sorts of questions about work. I asked her why she even cared. She said that I'd left my big flask and lunch bag in the front passenger seat of my van, and she could feel that something was up today. I was about to lie, but I was just too tired. I couldn't be bothered to put up any sort of facade. I just said, yeah, there is something up. Last night, when I was putting your drunk ass to bed, a message came up on your iWatch, which I read. I read all the other ones too. You're a disgusting cheat and I want nothing more to do with you. Her demeanor went from an arms-crossed person in power to a scared little girl within about a second. Great at keeping secrets. Begging that little rat for sex, huh? Yep, I read it all. She started sobbing, and I walked away upstairs into the shower. When I got out, she was sitting on the top stair, still crying. The excuses started right away. How she was drunk, vulnerable, had never done anything like that before, how he had messaged her first, and it didn't mean anything. She said she was never going to go through with it. Pretty much everything that everyone on air said she would say, like she had the playbook out. The only thing she didn't do was try to blame me. She probably knew I would have thrown her right out the door if she had tried that. I told her that I wanted a divorce and for her to be out of the house within a month. 
I also told her she was moving to the spare room. I've been pretty much ignoring her ever since, just scowling at her and shaking my head when she starts waffling nonsense. I don't want to hear it. She slept in the spare room last night, and I haven't spoken to or texted with her at all today. If I'm lucky, maybe she'll be gone when I get back from work, but my luck's not that good, I suppose, in getting her out. I was telling my parents what was happening, and my mother was adamant I wasn't throwing her out onto the streets. She and my mother are close and always have been. We have been together 11 years in December. My mother was saying she made a mistake and that we should sort it out like adults, that we'd been through too much together, and that she didn't actually do anything, it was just words. She completely took her side over mine. I couldn't believe it. Do I have no right to ask her to leave? If my mother is against it, it's going to be my house when my parents pass, and I did nothing wrong, so I'm not leaving. It's probably going to turn into a war of the roses. Part 2. I managed to get myself an appointment with a divorce lawyer for next week, so I'll be going to that to discuss my options. Until then, I'm just going to ignore my soon-to-be ex-wife, I guess. I know she's probably not going to admit anything else now. I'll never know if she was a really good liar or if she was just talking to him to get him on her side for an affair. Anyways, sorry about the delay in the update. Just got the chance to write it now as I'm finishing work. Well, back to the funhouse, I guess. Monday, November 16th. Hi, I thought I'd give an update since a lot of people have been personally messaging me asking for one. It's now been 20 days since I found out my wife was trying to cheat on me with my friend, and the situation has become hellish. I gave her a month to get out, and she's been sleeping in the spare room but it's clear now she doesn't have any intention of going. After she got in my mother's ear, she doesn't have anywhere to go at any rate, but that's not my problem. I've seen my divorce lawyer multiple times and am now in the process of drawing up a divorce petition and having my wife serve divorce papers. I've also opened my own bank account and taken 50% of the balance from our shared account. The atmosphere around the house has been weird, to say the least. The living room has turned into a no-man's land where no one frequents as we both spend the majority of our time in our rooms. I've also intentionally been working late a lot so. I don't have to interact with her much. I had been completely ignoring her, but after reading about the 180, I started implementing that and being civil, if a little cold towards her. I'm so glad I did this, as I was beginning to feel like a monster refusing to acknowledge her existence. It was not the right way to behave, and I ended up feeling like the one who had wronged her rather than the other way around. The only time I broke from the 180 was when I walked into the bathroom last week and found her sitting on the floor by the bath, crying. I helped her up and instinctively hugged her, though it was more of a moral support hug than one with much love attached to it. The sad thing is that I'm so suspicious of her now that I wouldn't put it past her to be waiting for me to come in so she could put on a performance. That probably isn't even true, but this is the sort of thought that's going through my head in this environment. It's just toxic. She's been crowing about how she'll do anything and everything to save this marriage, anything to prove to me that it was just a silly mistake. So, I brought up a lie detector test. I don't plan on ever getting one done, wouldn't even know where to start. I just wanted to gauge her reaction. She was all for it, well, until a few hours later when she came to me, tablet in hand, going on about how inaccurate they are and that anxiety and nervousness can throw up false readings. With her anxiety disorder and all, I just laughed. It wasn't even a normal chuckle either, it started as a bit of a cackle and ended in a childish giggle. It appeared she would do everything to save this marriage, well, everything except take a lie detector test. It doesn't even matter anyway. I meant what I said in my original post, every morsel of love I had for her dissipated into the atmosphere after I read her say those horrible things. I don't see her as my true love anymore, the person I could tell anything to and would trust with my life. I just see trash, trash that needs to be taken out before it stinks the place up. 
jacket holder has been the talk of the town since I exposed him to our friend group a few weeks back. It's safe to say he has no friends left among us and has been completely ostracized. I tried calling him a few times, but he refused to answer and then blocked my number. Screw that little rat. I hope it was worth it. I've spoken to my mother multiple times about this and, during a heated argument, asked her why she was taking my wife's side. Was there something she wasn't telling me here? What was she expecting us to do, live like roommates and go on like nothing happened? It's ridiculous. She said she has always seen my wife as the daughter she never had but always wanted. My mother had a stillborn daughter before I was born, and it has haunted her, so she latched onto my wife and has done so since we got together. As I said previously, they have a close bond. The fact that my wife doesn't have any family and only a few friends who have their own busy lives and families means if I threw her out, she would be all alone, and my mom thinks that's unacceptable, especially during a pandemic. She tried to get me to come to a compromise, saying that in three or four months we should look at it again and see where we are mentally, and she is pushing me to try couples counseling before I throw in the towel. I'm not doing that. The thought of being in the same house as my wife over Christmas makes me feel ill. She'll want to do it right, as she does every year, and it'll be a complete shit show. My dad, God love him, has never been much of a talker, never up nor down, just always there. He's a quiet, proud but timid man, and my mother's word has always been the one that matters in our house. People on here have been telling me that I'm selfish and spoiled, as it's not my house and I have no right to make demands, but it's now a case of my wife or me for my parents. If worst comes to worst, I'm ready to walk out the door and never come back. Screw this house. I have to be able to look at myself in the mirror with some semblance of self-respect, and someone has to keep their word in this debacle. If I do leave, my friend has said I can stay with him for a few weeks or so until I get myself sorted. If I do walk out that door, though, I'm done with my parents. I'll never speak to them again in my life. They'll probably see it as me giving up on them, me walking away without trying to at least have a go at fixing things first. I see it as them choosing someone who broke my heart over me. What will be the logistics of this once I'm gone? Just her staying there by herself, with my mother and father looking after a backstabber while their flesh and blood goes off alone? A little more info on the house, my parents let us move in a year after our wedding. It was an apparent belated wedding gift, although that was just chatter from them at the time. They were always planning on moving out and moving us in. I've spent tens of thousands on it over the years, but that's neither here nor there. I have fantasies of leaving this all behind, going somewhere new and starting again, but I don't have anywhere else to go. I've lived in this town all my life, it's all I know. Am I being too harsh here? I'm literally ready to slingshot my parents right out of my life, but I feel so torn. Why am I the one who has to lose everything and everyone? I've tried to be good, and I always thought you make your own luck and that good things happen to good people. Maybe I'm not as good as I think I am. Maybe I deserve all I get. Wednesday, December 2nd, well, since this morning, I no longer call that house home. I saw on the calendar that my wife had a hospital appointment with her ophthalmologist, so knowing she would be gone for a few hours, I took that as an opportunity to get my stuff together and move out, which I have. After getting my things moved and sorted, I put the house keys on the kitchen table along with the divorce papers I received from the lawyer last week and was on my way. I blocked both my wife and mother's numbers, and any communication I have with my wife going forward will be done through my lawyer. In terms of my living situation, I'm staying with a friend for a week or two, but hopefully, I should be in my own rented place before Christmas. I haven't spoken to my parents in a few weeks. The last time we spoke was via text, and I tried to tell my mother in explicit detail the things my wife was saying during her texts to Jacket Holder, why it hurt me so much, and why I didn't think it was her first time doing it, with the whole I'm great at keeping secrets comment. Thus, I could never trust her again.
my mother texted back saying she couldn't speak to me when I was like this and she would let me cool off. She tried to phone me a few days ago, and I blanked her call, and as I said a bit further up, since today I have blocked her number. I feel so let down by my parents, and at this point, it almost feels worse than the original betrayal from my wife. The way I'm feeling right now, I don't think I'll ever speak to them again. I think in times of strife, you look to your family to be strong for you, to be a rock and give you, the wronged one, support. My parents have been weak. They've made me feel like the one in the wrong, like I'm overreacting and it's me that's ripping this family apart. Well, it's not. I never asked them to move mountains for me, just move my cheating wife out of the house, and they made their choice. My father also had the chance to put his foot down for once in his life and stand up for me but didn't. You make your choices, and you live with them, I guess. Reading some of the comments on air from my previous posts, people have been saying things like I threw in the towel so easily, I was looking for a way out, and didn't love my wife because I didn't try hard enough to save things. But that's not true. I love my wife more than anyone on this earth, and I was broken when I discovered what she was doing. I think we all have boundaries, and once those boundaries have been crossed, things change irrevocably. When I read those horrible texts, something changed inside of me. I fell out of love with her, like being snapped out of a spell in the movies. Anything tried after that is just delaying the inevitable. I have to say that I'm interested in the whole dynamic of their relationship now that I'm gone. Are my parents going to continue supporting her, knowing that it has finished their relationship with their son? As for me, I'd love to travel. My wife hated flying, so most of our holidays had been to southern England, to places like Noe, Toway, Cornwall, and Devon. It would be great to travel abroad again. The last time I was abroad was when I was 20 for a holiday in Greece, so 13 years ago. I'd love to see a bit of America, so once this pandemic calms down, I've definitely got my sights on the States. Thanks. Bye. Wednesday, May 26, 2021 It's been over seven months since I first posted on Reddit, and I honestly thought that was it for me, as I didn't need any more advice. I had made my decisions and done what I said I would. But I got a phone call this morning that dragged me back into the mire. I have moved 15 miles away, changed my phone number, and am still in the process of divorcing my wife. She has completely ignored all the requests from my divorce lawyer to cooperate, which has hindered things. We're now in the process of putting in an application for deemed service and trying to have her served officially by the courts. If she continues to ignore it, I can proceed with a divorce without her input. This morning, while at work, I got a phone call from my friend telling me that my dad was trying to get in touch as my mother is not well and would it be okay if he gave him my number? I said okay, and my dad phoned to tell me mom is in the hospital. She's stable, though not great. Obviously, I was shocked as I hadn't heard my dad's voice for so long. It was also the most emotional I've ever heard him. He told me my mom really wants to see me, so would I meet him at the hospital tonight and go in and see her with him? I said okay and arranged to meet him outside the hospital. I ended up going home from work as I couldn't concentrate, and I'm climbing the walls here wondering if I've made the right decision, wondering if I'm about to get dragged back into the show that I walked away from. I've never felt so nervous in my life, and the lack of control I have over the situation has sent my mind spiraling in lots of different directions. I feel like I'm walking into a burning building blindfolded with no idea where the exits are. Why does she want to speak to me now? Has she had a change of heart? Unless she's also had a personality transplant while in there, I find that unlikely. Will my wife be there? I have no interest in ever seeing her again. I'm still angry about what transpired with them and the way they took my cheating wife's side over mine. I've been going back and forth in my head about going at all, but I will go. I was also thinking about seeing if she wanted to speak over the phone instead but I'm not sure if she would do that or even if she's well enough. 
I feel like the bad guy here and that I might have caused this by walking away. How would you handle this? Saturday, May 29th. Sorry about the late update. I spent the last few days trying to digest what happened and how I feel. I did end up going to the hospital on Wednesday night after much toing and froing. I was genuinely about to back out at the last minute as I felt my resolve crashing, but I needed some closure and knew that I wouldn't forgive myself if I didn't go when something happened. When I drove into the hospital car park, I had this surreal feeling of paranoia and was half expecting my wife to jump out from behind a bush or something. I met my dad at the entrance, and it was pretty awkward as he tried to hug me and I said no. I then said if my wife is here in any way, shape, or form, then I am about turning and out the door. He assured me she wasn't, and we made our way to the ward where mom was. When I saw my mother, I got the fright of my life as she looked like she had been in the wars. Never have I seen her look so frail. She's got an extreme black eye and a lot of bruising and purple and yellow marks down one side of her face. She took a serious fall, broke two ribs, shattered her elbow, and banged one side of her head slash face on the ground, so elbow, ribs, then head in that order as she went down. She looked zombified but perked up when she saw me. She told me how much she's missed me and that she wasn't sure she'd ever see me again. I told her if she had really wanted to get a hold of me, she could have done so. We spoke for a bit about what exactly had happened and how she was down for a few hours before my dad found her. Also, that she was determined to get back to normal and mend bridges with me. I brought up my wife and that I had been pushing for a divorce, but she was either ignoring the letters or wasn't getting them. So I asked if she's still in the house. Mom admitted she was and dad started to look uncomfortable. I just looked away in disgust. Mom started saying how lost my wife is without me and that she's not in a good way. I knew then that nothing would change. She hadn't had an epiphany or seen things from a new perspective, she just wanted the status quo back. She said the house was my home and always would be, but I told her I didn't want it. It means nothing to me anymore, and all it holds are bad memories. I stayed for under an hour. When I left, I said if I wanted to get in contact, I would, but not to wait by the phone for my call because she might be waiting a while. When dad walked me out, he asked if I would keep in touch with him, and I said I would. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't know, time will tell. When I got home, my emotions were all over the place, from sadness to anger, but I'm glad I went. I couldn't help thinking about my wife and what she once meant to me. It will never not hurt when I think about everything that's happened in the last seven months. It honestly doesn't feel real. The speed at which everything fell apart was just spellbinding. I know life comes at you fast, especially when you're not paying attention, and I wasn't paying attention. It was just sheer luck that I found out about her trying to cheat on me, cosmic coincidence, nothing more. I never saw the signs or put everything together. I just saw something on her watch, and it tore my life apart. I know now that wasn't the only time. I know it in my heart. I see what she is and feel no love for her, only contempt. I feel she stole the best years of my life. When I think about all the good times, they're just soured. It feels like someone else's life, not mine. My friend was saying I should see a therapist or something to try and let everything out, or else this will fundamentally change who I am and the way I build relationships going forward. That's something I'm going to do, I think, as I do feel a bit broken inside. The last seven months have been the worst of my life, but I'd rather they happen than be kept in the dark. I'm just hurt that it happened the way it did, but you don't get to choose how someone screws you over, I guess. You just have to learn a lesson from it. I remember reading about loyalty being the most undervalued character trait, and I see that now. It's probably because you don't really know if someone is truly loyal to you until, well, they're not. It's not something you deal with every day, but now more than ever, I know how important a trait it is. Tuesday, July 20th, hi.
so I thought I'd post an update to my previous post, as quite a few things have happened. Firstly, I'm now in the home stretch in terms of divorce from my wife. She has signed the divorce papers and sent them to my divorce lawyer, so all that's left now are the formalities. She sent me a message via my dad where she said she's sorry for not letting me move on, that she thought she could save things, but now she knows she can't and she has to move on for her own well-being. I thank her for seeing she doesn't want anything in the divorce and said she's going to move out of the house when she can get on her feet, which I'm okay with. In terms of my mother, I haven't spoken to her yet, but my dad said she's doing a lot better after getting out of the hospital and getting some normality back. I don't know how things will pan out with them, but I've said that if the house is going to be mine, then I want them to put it into my name now to give me some security. Then we can start trying to build a bridge. We'll see how that goes. My biggest battles ahead are in my head and trying to get over everything that has happened. The brain is a wonderful yet frightening thing. To give you an example, I can still taste the truffles I scoffed and then threw up at my grand's house when I was like five. I've never eaten truffles again, but I can still taste the damn things 30 years later when I think about it. What I'm getting at is I don't want to harbor thoughts, feelings, and opinions about everything that's happened 30 years down the road. I don't want to be one of those older people who's had everything good knocked out of them by the pain of life. You often hear about those people, how they used to be good, kind, or funny, but somewhere along the line, they've had experiences that have forever changed them, turned them into a person they never wanted to be, and all that's left is pain. I don't want to be that person. I have to let this pain go before it consumes me. I have started therapy and spoken to a psychiatrist both over the phone and in person. It has helped me a lot to speak candidly about everything, even if only for a little while. My psychiatrist also said something to me that really struck a chord. When I was moaning about how my best years were behind me, she said, your best years are the years you've got left. What I think she meant is that the past is gone, it doesn't exist except in your mind. But the here and now does, and you can choose to make the most of it or live in a past that isn't real to anyone but you. It's definitely a phrase I'm going to try and remember when I feel down. I said in one of my previous posts that I wanted to travel, and that is finally happening. My friend has committed to coming with me, and we're booking a flight to New York at the beginning of October for a week. I'm really looking forward to it. I've always wanted to see New York when the leaves change, it reminds me of that movie You've Got Mail. I want this to be just the beginning of my adventures in terms of traveling. I want my latter thirties to be filled with memories from escapades abroad. Well, that's the plan anyway. All I know is that, for the first time in what seems like a long time, I'm waking up with hope in my heart and walking with a spring in my step. If that's not progress, then I don't know what is. Wednesday, October 27th, well, it's now been a year since my first post on Reddit so I thought it would be fitting to give one last update and end things here. First things first, I'm now officially divorced. It feels like a weight has been lifted but also a firm end to what was nearly a third of my life. I actually saw my ex-wife for the first time since last December as I was walking into a shop in the town center about a month back after visiting a friend. She was opening the door to walk out just as I was walking in. We were both wearing masks but I noticed it was her right away, and we made eye contact. She mumbled something that I couldn't make out, then we just sort of stared at each other for a few seconds before I walked inside. As I was walking around the shop, this feeling of utter sadness enveloped me, and I had to take a minute to compose myself. It just goes to show all it takes is one look for you to feel straight back to square one. Do I miss her? No. I miss the person I thought she was but that person doesn't exist anymore, if she ever did. I don't wish her hurt or hardship, though, I really don't. I just refuse to move forward any longer with hatred in my heart. The only person it will burden in the long run is me. I also found out from a friend's girlfriend that she was sure she saw my ex-wife outside a pub in the city all over another guy a couple of years back. 
Apparently, she never said anything to me or my friend because she wasn't sure it was her and she didn't want to meddle. I'm extremely pissed off with her, as I could have done with that information years ago. It's hardly conclusive, but I could have confirmed if she was out that night, and it would have saved me a lot of heartache in the long run. Now I know why I've never liked her. One of the reasons we wanted to book a flight to New York in October, apart from wanting to see New York in October, was that the travel ban between the USA and UK was supposed to be lifting in September for fully vaccinated travelers. Unfortunately, that has now been moved back to November 8, which has put our plans into limbo. My friend also can't get the time off work now until the new year, so if I'm to go, I'll have to go alone, which is a bit disappointing since we were both invested in going together. I'm pretty set on going in the new year with him, though I'll have to think things through more thoroughly. One thing this pandemic has consistently been able to do is throw up curveballs, so I really can't complain or say I'm surprised. I'll get there, though, by hook or by crook. This is just the start of my journey in that regard. I'm struggling when it comes to my parents and that all. I feel towards them is complete apathy. I'm just having a difficult time feeling anything, and no matter how hard I try, I don't think that'll change. My dad has tried to rebuild the relationship, but I just don't care anymore. That might sound harsh, but it's the truth. I said in my last post that I wanted them to put the house in my name, though I haven't followed up on that. I think at that point I was just angry and wanted to prove my superiority at the beginning of our conversation. But really, I didn't care about the house at all. I think I would rather live in the house from Nightmare on Elm Street than there. It wouldn't change anything anyway. It can't turn back time or circumvent what they did. It's just the sad consequence of the choices they made. To anyone out there thinking of forgiving a cheater, please don't. I implore you, you're flogging a dead horse. Don't be that person desperately scrambling to put out fires started by your cheating partner while they gleefully reignite them. I feel stronger than ever after everything that's happened and reading a lot of infidelity support forums in the last year. You're letting yourself in for a world of hurt if you don't cut your losses. Kind of a relevant story, but at the start of the year, I had a really scary experience when I cut the back of my trouser leg on a metal bin while brushing against it at work. I never realized it had caused a cut until I went home. When I went to bed that night, I felt kind of weird. I woke up around 2 a.m., and my leg was pulsating. I felt deathly ill, was seeing double, dizzy, and was alternating between a severe fever and chills. I understood right away it could be sepsis, so I phoned an ambulance, which they said would be two hours plus since it was a Friday night at the height of COVID. My thoughts were doing light speed laps around my head while I was hyperventilating like crazy. You know what calmed me down? When I accepted that I was possibly going to die. Then, for some reason, I just didn't feel afraid anymore. I don't know if it was the whole accepting fate state of mind, but when I accepted that it might be over, it took all the permutations out of the equation, and everything became very simple and calm. I've been thinking about it a lot lately, and when I think about cheating and betrayal, I feel very similar. You have to accept that what you had is over. It's long gone. If someone is willing to plunder such depths and stab you in the back so mercilessly for their own gratification, fighting that unwinnable battle is noble and all, but when you're pissing into the wind with lottery odds of success, is it worth it? Is it worth the pain? I don't think so. I understand everyone has their own situations with kids, etc., but some fights are just straight-up folly. Except that it's over, and things will quickly become clearer. That's just my view. It's only after we've lost everything that we're free to do anything. Tyler Durden, Fight Club It's funny, I haven't written about my thoughts and feelings since I was in high school. I work on roofs for a living. This experience, though, has coaxed that side out of me, a side that I had pretty much forgotten existed. If something good has come from this fiasco, it's that I'm not going to bottle things up any longer. 
it's been cathartic for me to get things out there and see the bigger picture of my situation. Writing things down has helped me more than I ever imagined, so it's something I'm going to continue to do, even if it's just writing to myself in a journal or notepad. I believe there are moments in life when, in hindsight, you realize things were extremely precarious and could have gone either way. It terrifies me to think about what might have happened if I hadn't sought help here or encountered those dog walkers. I could have ended up blackout drunk, dangerously close to death in a ditch, or in jail for shooting at a coat hanger through someone's window after tearing through their house. Reflecting on it, it's frightening to consider where I might have ended up if things had taken a turn for the worse. I was in a terrible state, drunk, humiliated, and seething with rage, a combination that can lead to utter chaos. I'm genuinely grateful I made it through without causing harm to myself or others. Most of my posts have detailed the events as they unfolded. However, lately, I've focused more on my feelings about those events. Betrayal brings about such intense and invasive emotions. There's nothing quite like being betrayed by loved ones, it cuts deep and the resulting emotions are equally profound. Thank you for listening. In my first post after discovering the betrayal, I mentioned feeling like a worse person than before. Now, after everything that's happened, I feel stronger. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments below. Take care.